Well, I want to welcome everybody to this mm -hmm. second discussion that we're going to have between our, our same mm -hmm. two panel participants from the first discussion. The topic of this discussion is, is, is Islamic monotheism pure? Uh, again, please hold all applause, comments until the very end, and then we'll open it up for that. And then we're going to have, as Pastor George Saig said, we're going to have our, our Q&A where there's going to be three questions asked to each of our, our panelists. So we're going to begin this discussion with Dr. Shabir Ali is going to have his 20 minute opening statement. So Dr. Ali, you're free to begin when you're ready. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jim Baber. And uh, folks, I'm so glad that uh, we're back for the second uh, session uh, to deal with this new topic. Uh, I'm so uh, sad that uh, we're not together in the same room. I, I wish uh, that God will bring us together uh, before long uh, so that we can meet in friendship and uh, love and mutual respect and understanding. Uh, but for the moment, uh, let's do this uh, online. I I'm also uh, saddened by the fact that I just got news uh, that one a dear friend of mine is in a coma. I pray for him, and I ask you to pray for him as well. And uh, I pray for everyone who is sick all around the globe. May God give them a quick and uh, complete recovery. So let me... Uh, move on then with my uh, opening presentation. I'm going to uh, start my timer here, realizing that I should have started earlier. So I'll make this 18 minutes just to be sure. Um, okay. So why do I say that Islamic monotheism is pure? Uh, let me start by defining monotheism. It is the belief that there is only one God. Uh, for example, uh, Paul uh, says that there is no God but one in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 4. So that's a statement of monotheism. Then there is henotheism, which must be distinguished. Uh, that is the belief that there is only one God for us, without negating the possibility of there being other gods. That There may or may not be other gods uh, out there, but... For us, there is only one God. That's called uh, henotheism. Uh, an example of a statement to, to that effect is Paul saying, "For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven uh, or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father." First Corinthians chapter eight, verses number five to six. And then uh, there is monolatry which is basically the uh, worship of one God alone. An example uh, of a statement to that effect uh, is uh, in the Old Testament, where Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 13 in the American Standard Version reads, uh, Thou shalt fear Jehovah thy God, and him shalt thou serve. Uh, and uh, Jesus picks up upon that saying in Matthew chapter 4, verse number 10, where he says, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So obviously, monotheism includes some aspect of henotheism and uh, um, monolatry, uh, but uh, monotheism goes beyond these concepts uh, by insisting that there is, in fact, only one God. How does that insistence on the, the belief on only one God um, occur in Islam? I would say in two ways. One is in the Quran, and two is in Muslim practice. So let's start with the Quran. Uh, the first thing I want to observe is that the Quran refers to God by a specific name, and, and that avoids confusion between God and, and not God. Because uh, sometimes when people say the Lord, we cannot be sure uh, who exactly they mean, because it seems to be a generic title, uh, which could mean uh, God, or it could mean a human being, but it's a title of respect, and so on. Uh, so by, by using the term Allah, uh, it is clear to Muslims that uh, we are referring to the God that is spoken about in the Quran as the only God. So I, I must uh, explain this term Allah because for some people it may be uh, a new term. So etymologically speaking, this is what Encyclopedia Britannica explains. Etymologically, Allah is probably a contraction of the Arabic Al-Ilah, which means the God, uh, the origin of the name can be traced to the earliest Semitic writings in which the word for God was il or el, uh, the latter being an Old Testament synonym for Yahweh. Allah is the standard Arabic word for God used by Arab Christians as well as by Muslims. 
that this, uh, in addition to naming Allah as God, uh, the Quran uh, insists that Allah is the only God. There is no God but Allah. The declaration in Arabic, La ilaha illallah, is known to Muslims as the Kalima of Islam. Uh, that, that's the most basic creedal statement of a Muslim. There is no God uh, but Allah. This statement is repeated in the Quran many, many times in different ways. Uh, I've counted some 36 times just by a simple search uh, through a software that gives us all of the references uh, of a word or phrase uh, in the Quran. So this is something that occurs again and again. Let me uh, um, say that by contrast, we will notice that uh, in the Bible, the statement that there is only one God uh, does occur, but not as frequently as it occurs in the Quran, even though the Quran is a, a very much shorter book. Some say it is about four-fifths the size of the New Testament. So for the Quran to have this many uh, repeated statements that there is only this one God uh, shows the Quran's emphasis on monotheism. The Quran um, does more than this. It says that we are not to worship anyone other than Allah. And here too, we will have many statements. La ta'abudu illallah. Do not worship anyone other than Allah. Uh, the Quran also says that we are not to pray to anyone other than Allah. I use this as a separate category because uh, uh, worship and prayer might be slightly different. Prayer may include uh, just simply an appeal, like an appeal to a saint or uh, to a, a past prophet or uh, or some angel or uh, lesser being than than God. Uh, so uh, the Quran here too uh, interdicts and says, "La tad'u ma Allahi ahada." Do not uh, um, call uh, anyone else uh, along with uh, with God. Uh, the Quran also insists that we're not to make sacrifices to other than Allah. Uh, I came to appreciate this point more uh, uh, recently when I, I read the book by uh, James McGrath. Uh, Professor McGrath, in his book, The Only True God, pointed out that uh, in the book of Revelation, it looks like the one thing uh, that will distinguish between God and non-God uh, is uh, the question of whether or not sacrifices can be offered to that one. And uh, from the book of Revelation's point of view, sacrifice can be meant, uh, uh, offered only uh, to the, the one God. And uh, I came to appreciate then why the Quran says that we are not to eat the meat uh, that is sacrificed to other than God and uh, why we are not uh, allowed to uh, make our sacrifices to other than God. So in the story of Abraham, we find in the Quran in uh, Surah 6, uh, there is a mention of him turning his face uh, towards God in, in sincere devotion towards God. And Muslims are then told in that context to say, uh, uh, Say, my prayer, my sacrifice, my living and dying uh, is uh, for Allah, uh, the Lord of the worlds. Uh, as for eating the meat of, sacrifice, uh, of animal sacrifice to other than Allah, uh, the, the Quran uh, tells us that Muslims are not to do that. And, and certainly uh, the Satans will try to entice you to eat such meat. But if you do that, then you will be among the polytheists or those who ascribe partner along with God. Uh, so, uh, on the contrary, Muslims are told that when they eat, they should say Bismillah in the name of God and then eat. And that will erase any possibility uh, that th we're dealing with meat which has been sacrificed to others. Because even if it so happens that this meat arrived on the Muslim's uh, dinner table by mistake, by pronouncing the name of God over it, the Muslim will cancel uh, any such uh, evil effects of the food from, from the Quranic point of view. So with these uh, various components in mind, we can see that uh, the Quran actually uh, insists upon uh, monotheism and insists on it in a wide uh, variety of ways. Now, what is the unforgivable sin according to the Islamic faith? The unforgivable sin uh, is that is to ascribe anyone as partner along with God, to think that God has a, a, a an equal, uh, and Muslims would say also if God has a son, uh, this are, are such a close relationship that will compromise uh, the absolute divinity and and uh, 
uniqueness uh, of God, then this will count as shirk or uh, polytheism. Uh, shirk in Arabic uh, is, looks like the English word shirk, which means like the shirk one's responsibilities to um, uh, avoid one's responsibilities. Um, so the word shirk, written uh, the, the same way, but pronounced shirk in Arabic, means something like partner or associating a partner along with God. This is how it's understood in Islamic theology. And uh, we're, Muslims are definitely not allowed to do that. Again, we will find a plethora of statements in the Quran. La tushriku ma'allahi ahada. Do not uh, um, uh, associate anyone uh, along with uh, with God. So uh, we are not to think of God as uh, having a partner, a wife, a son, a daughter, uh, or any such relationships. It is thought that uh, such, such relationships are beyond God. He is uh, so different from everything else that we know. For example, in Surah 42, verse number 11, it says, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءِ Basir." There is nothing like unto him, and he is hearing and uh, and seeing. Uh, so in all of these ways, uh, the uh, emphasis is shown to be on uh, monotheism. Now, what about intercession? Can somebody intercede on our behalf? For we know that intercession is a factor in uh, Christianity. It is thought that Jesus is an advocate for us in heaven, is a, as is found in the Johannine uh, uh, correspondence. But uh, from the Quranic point of view, nobody can intercede along uh, with God except by the permission of God. So if uh, God permits somebody to intercede, uh, for someone else, that's to honor the intercessor. It's not that the intercessor has some kind of claim on God to make it necessary for God to bend and uh, and, and to give in to the intercessor. So in, in all of these different ways, the Quran is showing that God is the absolute monarchy. He is uh, transcendent and uh, there is nothing like unto him and nothing can compromise his uh, divinity. Now, that, of course, gives rise to um, some questions. Uh, for example, uh, in that case, who is the Prophet Muhammad? <laughs> if, the, if God is so uh, beyond uh, compare uh, and he's the only God, where, where, the, where does that leave the Prophet Muhammad? So for Muslims, uh, Muhammad is only a prophet. He's a messenger. He is a human being. Uh, God uh, selected a human being in his time and place and gave him a message to teach others. So at the end of the 18th uh, chapter, we have... Uh, uh, that uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, is being told to declare, Innama ana basharum mislukum, I am only a human being like the rest of you. Yuha ilayya annama ilahukum ilahu wahid. It has been revealed to me that uh, your God is only one God. Faman kana yarju liqa rabbihi fal yamal amalan salihan wa la yushrik bi ibadati rabbihi ahada. So whoever desires to meet his Lord uh, should uh, do good works and uh, should not uh, ascribe any partners along with God. Where does that leave Jesus? From a Muslim point of view as well, Jesus is one of the great prophets of God. And like the prophet Muhammad on whom be peace, he's also a human being. Uh, though he is called by some lofty titles in the Quran, he's called a kalima, a word from God. He's called a ruh, a spirit from God. And yet Jesus on whom be peace is shown to be a human being and a servant and messenger of God. Uh, to the extent that God could say, قُلْ فَمَيَّمْ لِكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ شَيْئًا إِنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يُهْلِكَ الْمَسِيحَ بْنَ مَرْيَمَ وَأُمَّهُ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا Who is going to stop God from uh, destroying, if it so uh, be his will, uh, Jesus, his mother, and whoever is on, on earth? Uh, so this again declares the absolute monarchy of God and uh, that Jesus and everyone else uh, are his uh, creatures and, and humble uh, servants. So to the angels... The Quran says, uh, Jesus and the uh, close angels uh, are not going to demur from being servants uh, of God. So what about the Holy Spirit? The Islamic equivalent is what is referred to in the Quran as Ruhul Qudus, which would mean the spirit of holiness. So 
uh, this uh, it, it gives some ambiguity as to who exactly is this uh, Holy Spirit. Muslim scholars have tied two verses of the Quran together uh, to conclude that the Holy Spirit is the angel Gabriel. One verse uh, says that it is the angel Gabriel who reveals the Quran to the heart of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Another verse says it's the Ruh al-Qudus who reveals uh, the Quran, the spirit of holiness. And so putting two and two together, Muslim scholars generally say that Ruh al-Qudus, the spirit of holiness, is the angel Gabriel. Angel Gabriel and the spirit more generally is shown to be a creature of God uh, such that uh, they, they, are, they are dependent upon God and uh, or, or rather uh, the Ruh al Qudus and the angels in general are dependent upon God and so on the day of judgment the Quran says the spirit and the angels will be there lined up uh, on the day of judgment no one will dare to speak except one whom the uh, beneficent God uh, permits to speak, and then too they have to speak the truth. So this shows that uh, they are all obedient to and subservient to God. The second um, way in which uh, monotheism is uh, expressed in the Islamic faith is through Muslim practice. Uh, we have the five pillars of Islam, and all of these show uh, utmost dedication to God. This is most uh, clearly expressed uh, in the Shahada and the declaration of the Muslim faith. The, for somebody to become a Muslim, the first thing that one has to say by, by formal declaration is uh, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness that there is no uh, God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So uh, clearly the Shahada or the, the first pillar of Islam is about uh, monotheism. The uh, second pillar of Islam is the prayer uh, that Muslims perform five times per day. And as you must have seen, Muslims uh, pray by standing, by bowing, and also by prostrating on the ground in, in a way similar to Jesus prostrating in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, so in doing so, Muslims are showing their utmost devotion to the one true God, the unseen creator of the heavens and the earth. Even the prayer pre prelude to the prayer, uh, includes the adhan or the call to prayer. Whenever a television camera uh, turns its attention to somewhere in the Muslim world, whether in a movie or some other uh, show, uh, you will hear the adhan or the call to prayer. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. God is the greatest, God is the greatest. And then it follows up by saying, uh, la ilaha illallah. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. Uh, so that declaration is there uh, ringing in the wake of Muslim communities uh, throughout the world. And Muslims uh, are constantly reminded uh, to adhere to monotheism and a very strict monotheism. Uh, in the prayer itself, there is what is referred to as the tashahud. In the last sitting posture, uh, the Muslims uh, will uh, pray a certain prayer, which includes the words, uh, again, that say, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. And at that point, the Muslims are directed to raise their, their index finger to indicate that there is only one God. So just as the Jews were directed to tie uh, the the uh, Shema on their wrists and on their foreheads is a constant reminder. Muslims have the constant reminder, not only that uh, our God is Yahweh alone, but that there is no God except Allah. So uh, going from a, a, a henotheistic statement to a, a, a monotheistic uh, a statement. Now, uh, we can go um, on in detail, but uh, I uh, have to end my talk here very uh, quickly. Uh, I'll just mention a couple of more things uh, in brief. Uh, the animal sacrifice. Uh, Muslims perform an anim animal sacrifice uh, yearly, and this is only for the sake of God. So we repeat the same wor words. Uh, our sacrifice is only for the sake of God. In daily life, uh, Muslims abstain from eating things which are sacrificed to idols, and this is the main reason why Muslims are going about looking for halal uh, food. This is slightly different from kosher in that there is this emphasis uh, that we must avoid that which is sacrificed to a name other than than God. And uh, Muslims in their daily lives, you will hear say, uh, say inshallah, it, which means if God wills, and a variety of that, mashallah, whatever God wills. And uh, in uh, respect 
So some good news, a Muslim will say, Alhamdulillah, which means pray to God, praise be to God, or Subhanallah, may God be glorified. These are common in Muslim terminology and in Muslim societies. Uh, so I'm going to end at this point, unless I have some more uh, time. Uh, uh, Professor Weber, do I have some more time? That is it, Dr. Ali. Okay, so in that case, I want to thank you all for your patient listening. I'll speak to you after I hear Anthony. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. So, Reverend Rogers, you have your opening statement for 20 minutes, and you're free to begin. Thank you. As in the first debate, I want to begin by giving all praise and thanks to the triune God. I thank him for his goodness and graciousness towards me, and saving me by his son and giving me his spirit. I also pray the same for Shabir, that the Lord would draw him to himself and all the other Muslims who are listening. Uh, like Shabir, I wish he was here in person. I hear that the, the uh, discussions after these sorts of things are even better than what takes place in front of everyone else. And that would have been great uh, for both of us. I'm also sorry to hear about Shabir's friend and do pray that the Lord Jesus Christ would raise his friend up and deliver him from this malady. Uh, I want to begin then uh, by addressing the topic. Uh, in his massive scholarly tome, uh, Anthropomorphic Depictions of God, Muslim scholar Zulfikar Ali Shah writes, and I quote, in Islam, God stands alone, transcendent and majestic. The faith is marked by a strict and uncompromising ethical monotheism, signifying the absolute oneness, unity, uniqueness, and transcendence of God in its highest and purest sense. Thus, it is a universal truth that mainstream Islam has always emphasized the absolute transcendence and unity of God, avoiding corporeal notions and anthropomorphic images of his being, end quote. You'll note that this definition of monotheism, much like the one we heard from Shabir, uh, its definition of monotheism as uh, this is monotheism in its purest and highest sense, positively asserts the absolute oneness of Allah. Uh, oneness without qualification, in other words, and negatively rejects any kind of plurality, including anthropomorphic images of his being. While this kind of definition is a popular one used by Muslims, especially in their dawah efforts to convert others, it's not only misleading, but flagrantly contradicted by the Islamic sources. While it's certainly true that the Quran says things like, say he is Allah, the one, Surah 112, uh, the Islamic sources just as certainly undermine this statement in a multitude of ways. Uh, to illustrate one of the ways it does so in the brief time I have, I've chosen to look at a problem that I call shirk, shorn, or sham. What I mean by those three terms will be apparent momentarily. According to the Quran, the Hadith, and the understanding of the early Muslims known as the traditionalists, Allah has a multiplicity of hypostatic attributes real qualities or things that exist in addition to each other and in addition to Allah's essence. Attributes like life, knowledge, seeing, hearing, power, will, endurance, and speech. To get a handle on what's being said here so you might see how radically different this is from any claim that Allah is an absolute unity devoid of plurality, consider what this means with respect to just two of Allah's many attributes. First, Allah's attribute of seeing. According to the Quran, the Hadith, and the early traditionists, Allah is not omnipresent, but is seated on top of a throne that's supported or held up by eight goat-like angels, which is on top of seven heavens, which are on top of seven earths, and so forth. On this understanding, when the Quran says that Allah is near <clears throat> and is all-seeing, it isn't saying that Allah is personally present, but is referring to the fact that his seeing or knowledge is present. In other words, there's a bifurcation between Allah and his attribute of seeing. Allah's on his throne, but somehow his attribute of seeing is here. I hope you see the radical distinction that this entails. A second example, uh, because the Quran is identified with Allah's attribute of speech, the early traditionists on the basis of the Quran and Sunnah held that the Quran is eternal and uncreated. However, as Ahmed bin Hanbal, Ibn Mubarak, al-Bayhaqi, a whole host of Muslim scholars uh, said, it is the position of the Salaf and Kalaf, the early Muslims, uh, among the major scholars of Hadith, this is a quote, that the Quran is neither created nor is it the creator, because it's Allah's speech. So it's an attribute, it's eternal, but it's not the creator, it's not Allah. Allah's attribute of speech, then, is viewed as an actually subsisting eternal thing in addition to Allah's essence, 
In fact, it's so much an additional thing in addition to Allah that the Hadith tell us that the Quran will appear on the day of resurrection and intercede for Muslims like a pale man. In fact, you heard uh, Shabir just a moment ago saying that this is one of the very things that uh, Talheed re uh, rejects. There's no intercession with Allah because there's only one God. This was a belief of the pagans. Here, according to the Hadith, the Quran is an eternal thing in addition to Allah is going to intercede for Muslims. But Shabir told us that is shirk, and I quite agree. But remember uh, further that these this is just two, one or one of the two attributes that I've mentioned. Allah has a whole host of attributes. This is what Muslim scholar G.F. Haddad said in his article on the uncreatedness of the divine speech, meaning the Quran. And I quote, we Sunnis, Orthodox Sunnis, hold that there are as many exceptions to the phrase, Allah has created everything, as there are divine attributes, and that to speak of any of his attributes as created is kufr, that is unbelief. Notice what he said. The statement that everything that exists other than Allah is created, he says there are as many exceptions to that statement. It's a statement, by the way, that Shabir uh, made a moment ago. Everything else is his creature. No, according to G.F. Haddad, there are multiple entities in addition to Allah's being, like the Quran, like all these other attributes that exist, and some of them will even intercede for Muslims. To make matters worse, not only does Allah have a multiplicity, not absolute unity, a multiplicity of attributes according to the Quran, uh, in, the, in the Hadith and so forth, attributes through which Muslims may intercede with him, like the Qur'an, but these attributes even include anthropomorphic qualities, parts that make up a whole, not absolutely one, in other words. Parts like a face, hands, two right hands, a shin, fingers, a palm, foot, and even, well, I'll get to that in a moment, to take up just one of these attributes as an example, the Quran and Hadith mention Allah's hands numerous times. Unlike the Bible, where such expressions are either figurative expressions used in poetic sections of the Bible, or passages that refer to a divine condescension, a theophany, where God has temporarily appeared in human form, the Quran and Hadith make it painfully clear that such expressions, when used for Allah, are to be understood literally and as descriptions or qualities that circumscribe Allah's reality or characterize him as he really is. In other words, they're neither figurative nor theophanic. For example, when the, uh, the Quran speaks of creation in general being, uh, it, it speaks of creation in general being a result of Allah's saying be, but there are certain things according to the Quran and Hadith that were particularly or directly created by Allah's hands. For example, in Surah 3875 of the Quran, Satan is upbraided for refusing to bow down to uh, Adam, uh, even though Allah says, I created him with my own two hands. This is the stated reason why Satan should have bowed down to Adam, because he was made with Allah's own two hands. This made him unique from all other creatures. You also have numerous hadith confirming the point. On the day of resurrection, we're told that the people are going to seek out people to intercede for them. Remember shirk. People are going to seek out people to intercede for them. First, they're going to go to Adam thinking he'll be able to intercede with Allah because after all, he's special in Allah's eyes. Allah created him with his own two hands. You also have a hadith talking about Moses and Adam debating one another. Uh, and, and, and Moses says, are you that Adam that got us kicked out of paradise even though you were created directly with Allah's own two hands? And then Adam gets the better of Moses, we're told, because he said, didn't you have the Torah that Allah wrote with his own hand and gave it to you hand to hand? He says, you knew what my fate was before I was ever born. It's because this was written in the Torah 40 years before my creation, the Hadith says. Over and over again, the Hadith say that Allah has hands, and this is understood quite literally and was understood quite literally by the early traditionists. Well, one more attributes, as if all of this isn't, I think, shocking enough, Another attribute mentioned in several ahadith found in Sahih Bukhari, as well as other respected hadith collections, tells us that once Allah finished the creation, the rahim, the womb, identified as a feminine figure, stood up and grabbed Allah by his loins. And Allah shrieked out in response, stop it, what are you doing? According to the Hadith, other traditions besides these three in Bukhari also speak of the womb growing a tongue and grabbing various parts of Allah's body, his waist, his side, his shoulders, and so on. Folks, this is not pure monotheism. 
It's not the pure monotheism Islam claims to be. It asserts a multiplicity of actually subsist, uh, subsisting things, eternal entities in addition to Allah, things through which one may intercede with him, and it most certainly does not preclude anthropomorphism, as Islamic scholars sometimes claim, but the early traditionists most certainly rejected. Well, because some Muslims came to believe that such teachings violated the demands of absolute monotheism, that is, there were other Muslims who came to reject this, groups like the Jahmiya and the Mu'atizili and so forth, and because they were all the more scandalized by the idea that Allah has attributes, including loins, uh, they not only rejected uh, the Hadiths and the Quranic statements about such attributes, they denied that Allah has any attributes. Allah must be divested or shorn of all attributes, right? Uh, they would quote passages like Surah 42, 11, a passage you heard Shabir mention uh, a moment ago, where it says there's nothing like Allah. Well, other creatures have attributes. If Allah is not like anything, he must not have any attributes. Uh, this position, as I said, was held by numerous Muslims. In fact, it's been held by, uh, it was the uh, predominant position, at least from the 8th to 10th centuries, and has been held by various Muslims down to the present day, including one of my favorite, Muhammad Assad, who is uh, well regarded by Dr. Ali. Numerous times he's quoted Muhammad Assad and said that his translation and commentary are uh, good and reputable. Listen to what Muhammad Assad says about Surah 42.11 and Surah 112.4. This is his footnote 88 to Surah 6 of the Quran. He says, the very concept of definition implies the possibility of a comparison or correlation of an object with other objects. Allah, however, is unique, there being nothing like unto him, Surah 42.11, and therefore nothing that could be compared with him, Surah 112.4, with the result that any attempt at defining him or his attributes is a logical impossibility and, from the ethical point of view, a sin. The fact that he is undefinable makes it clear that the attributes, he puts them in scare quotes, he's saying there he doesn't have attributes. That, uh, th this makes it clear that uh, the attributes of Allah mentioned in the Quran do not circumscribe his reality, but rather the perceptible effects of his activity on and within the created universe." Uh, end quote. Here, Assad tells us that the so-called attributes are not attributes at all. They do not circumscribe his reality, which means they don't really tell us what Allah is like. They're just empty names or sounds and not also descriptors. Assad also tells us that these names are simply derived from the perceptible effect of his activity on and within the universe created by him, which means that we may just as well call Allah unholy as well as holy, evil as well as good, since both are equally perceptible effects of what happens in the world, from which these empty names and uh, sounds used for Allah are derived. Assad uh, fortifies these observations over and over again in the Quran. For one more example, in Surah 112, footnote 2, Assad wrote, The fact that Allah is one and unique in every respect, without beginning and without end, has its logical correlate in the statement that there is nothing that could be compared with him, thus precluding any possibility of describing or defining him. Consequently, the quality of his being is beyond the range of human comprehension or imagination, which also explains why any attempt at depicting God by means of figurative representations or even abstract symbols must be qualified as a blasphemous denial of the truth." End quote. Putting this all together on the basis of certain Quranic statements, this view tells us that uh, to say Allah ha actually has attributes constitutes a denial of his absolute unity is a logical impossibility and, in fact, a blasphemous denial of the truth, which means all we're left with on this view uh, regarding Allah is these names and so forth that are just sound and fury signifying nothing, as Shakespeare once said. That is to say, while advocates of this position charge those who affirm that Allah has attributes with shirk, this view tells us that Allah is shorn of all attributes. It reduces Allah to an undefinable and therefore unknowable blank. To state the obvious, this isn't pure monotheism. This is rank agnosticism and skepticism masquerading as theism. It's not theism at all. And so uh, it's also not the case, as Zulfikar Ali Shah claimed, uh, it's not what we may call ethical monotheism. Indeed, a, a God who has no definite nature, no defining attributes, who may just as well be called holy or unholy from the perceptible effects of his activity, has absolutely nothing to do with ethics, nothing to do with grounding ethics. Now, because affirming that Allah has attributes constitutes shirk, 
It asserts a real plurality for Allah, and denying his attributes divests him of uh, divests him of all defining qualities and, and reduces Allah to a blank. Other Muslims have tried to make up for this, and they've tried to combine this. The, the later Ash'aris, for example, came to say that, uh, this is what I call sham, but they, they claim that Allah's attributes are neither he nor other than he, which is nothing but a bald-faced contradiction. If Allah's attributes are not he, then they're other than he. And if they're not other than he, well, they are he, right? That, this is, this is uh, the position of orthodox Ash'arism to this day. It's not, it's not a solution to the problem. The, the Islamic sources involve Muslims in an internal contradiction. They either assert a plurality for their deity and thus violate their own strictures of what constitutes pure monotheism or a violation of it, shirk, or they have to reduce their God to a blank, or to get out of it, they have to engage in uh, absurd uh, reasoning. For these reasons, then, I do not believe that Islam teaches pure monotheism. Now, I do believe there's a solution to these problems. This, namely the doctrine of the Trinity, but we're not debating the doctrine of the Trinity today. Uh, we already did that, actually. We did that earlier. So I hope to hear what Shabir has to say regarding these issues, because for me, uh, they show not only that the Islamic teachings depart from the teaching of the prophets and the apostles, but they're not even internally coherent. And so I'll conclude with that. Thank you, Reverend Rogers. And that concludes opening statements. We are going to have our first phase of rebuttal. That'll be 15 minutes for each of our participants. Dr. Ali, you're free to begin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Baber. And um, Anthony, it was delightful to hear you uh, speak. Uh, and uh, I found myself chuckling. Uh, uh, in response to some of what you had to say, but I, I listen respectfully and I like to engage with your points respectfully as well. Uh, let me begin where you left off with the Trinity as a solution to whatever you perceive to be the problems that Muslims uh, face uh, in, in theological thinking. I'd like to say right off the bat, uh, Anthony, that, that the Trinity is not a solution. In fact, the Trinity is a, a much bigger problem than any of the problems you have imagined uh, for Muslims. Uh, so while you say that Muslims have a difficulty in thinking about the attributes of God, well, Christians would have the same difficulty uh, because if you say the Father has attributes, the Father has knowledge, certainly. Uh, Jesus had knowledge, but he left his knowledge behind in the kenosis when he came upon the earth. And then uh, somehow he must have picked up his knowledge again. So the knowledge seems to have a separate existence apart from the second person of the Holy Trinity. So these persons of the Holy Trinity themselves have attributes and multiple attributes. And, and we can well imagine that if they're God and the Muslim Allah is God, then just as the Muslim Allah has many attributes, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit must have those many attributes as well, like knowledge, power, will, uh, hearing, seeing, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so uh, are the same questions we can ask of our Christian friends. Does the Father have this attribute eternally? Is the attribute uh, something uh, that is the, the Father himself, or is it something separate from and distinct from the Father? And uh, not only Muslims might be puzzled by such theological thinking, but also Christians and Jews uh, who are monotheists. Uh, so that, 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 you know, taking the Trinity, however, is, is a further uh, com uh, compounding of the problem because not uh, th uh, the attributes uh, has have to be explained for each individual in the Trinity. So now you have three times the problem, but now you have a bigger problem in that suddenly you have persons within what you call the Godhead, and uh, and and the question is where do these persons come from, and how can you make these three one? But as for the attributes, uh, I think the Asheris have reached uh, a reasonable solution to this to say that uh, they are attributes of God. Let's not say that they are God himself, because uh, speak about my knowledge. Is that me or is it something other than me? Uh, so on the one hand, it is me. That's what I know. That's my mind. Uh, on the other hand, it is not other than me. It's not something else. It's not somebody else's knowledge. It is my knowledge. So th there can be a space in between uh, two uh, extremes. 
One extreme is to say it is not God. The other extreme is to say that it is God. And the balance in between is to say that this is something mysteriously uh, that we must speak about in reference to God. We can't say that God has no knowledge, but then uh, we, we have to stop there. So that's a reasonable uh, outcome. And, and it's one that Christians can embrace as well with regards to the attributes either of the Father or of the Son or of the Holy uh, Spirit, so long as we do not speak about one of them divesting himself of a, a necessary attribute which is uh, knowledge in terms of the kenosis so no the Trinity is not uh, a solution and uh, what you imagine to be a problem uh, for Muslims is uh, gonna be equally if it is a problem a problem for Christians and Jews but it's more of a compound uh, problem for uh, Christians now, uh, you say that uh, uh, Dr. Zulfikar Ali Shah defined uh, monotheism in his particular way. Now, Dr. I respect Dr. Zulfikar Ali Shah. I would even describe him as my friend. Uh, but uh, he himself will admit that uh, his attempts to define monotheism is not the final word. The final word is the word of God. And I have cited many passages from the Quran that actually tell us what monotheism is. That is to leave off everyone else, don't pray to anyone else, pray only to God, worship God alone, have no other God but this one God, and, and so on. So there's no problem with that. Now, now if you say that anthropomorphism is a, is a problem, uh, well then let's think about anthropomorphism in, in the Christian idea. Uh, I, 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 I'm not saying that it is a problem or it isn't, but uh, think about uh, the, this before you raise this objection, Anthony. Uh, it, it, Let's start from the end. You say that uh, God absorbed a man into uh, the Godhead. Uh, so now God suddenly is a man. And, and he has all of the features uh, of, of a human being. Uh, now, Jesus, of course, uh, was a young man. And uh, uh, we don't know how he spent his teenage years because there is the, there, the 18 uh, years are missing between ages 12 and uh, 30. How did he exercise his humanity and all of the functions of his uh, young, male, healthy body? Uh, none of this is uh, being described, but you're saying that uh, somehow Christ walking in Palestine 2,000 years ago was God. So what was God doing with all of these uh, body parts? Uh, and uh, it, more than this, you say that God... Uh, uh, was uh, manifesting himself as a human being. In the Old Testament, God came and met with Abraham, and he actually ate food. And Jesus, in his post-resurrected uh, state, also, according to the Gospel of Luke, ate food with his disciples. So he must have had a body that is solid enough to retain food. Otherwise, by the time he tries to grab the food, the, 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 the food would slip right of it, out of his hands, or rather, his hands would pass through the food. How would he then be able to uh, digest it, the, the, digest the food? I Either the lamb kebabs that uh, Yahweh is said to have eaten in uh, in Abraham's presence uh, in in the book of Genesis, or uh, Jesus having dinner and drinking with his uh, disciples. So these are all severe problems for Christianity, uh, Anthony. So you can understand why I chuckled uh, some of the time, and not out of any disrespect, uh, but um, because of the of this, uh, you know, thinking of it all in this way. Now, uh, Anthony, you relied a lot on on hadith, and uh, you will re recall that in my presentation, I relied a lot on the Quran. I'm not saying that hadith is of no worth, but uh, in terms of the core teachings of Islam. Uh, uh, the Quran is the most dependable uh, document. Hadith can be used to supplement the Quran, especially when it comes to the details of our prayer and Islamic practice. But there have been many scholars in our past history who said that hadith uh, are not reliable when it comes to defining Muslim doctrine. And some, in fact, have said that hadith are not even uh, reliable in terms of imposing obligations, uh, because generally the hadiths uh, have been circulated by word of mouth uh, for many generations until they were put into the written forms that we have now. And some of the most major collections uh, were given to us uh, by collectors working in the third century uh, of Islam. So a lot of water had passed under the bridge. People invented things, they changed things, sometimes not deliberately, sometimes accidentally, and sometimes, in fact, also deliberately. Now, uh, Anthony, you mentioned various groups like the Jahmites and Mu'tazilis and so on. So there were many groups who invented hadiths to suit their own purposes. So those who thought that God had a corporeal body, they also 
invented uh, hadiths to justify that view. I'm not saying that there aren't verses in the Quran that speak of certain parts uh, of, of God's body, uh, but uh, there is not enough there in the Quran to build a full-fledged doctrine that God actually has a body. There is a mere mention of God's uh, uh, eyes and, and God's hand uh, or hands uh, and so on, uh, but uh, not the kinds of details that are found in, in the Hadith. So what is mentioned in the Quran can easy, easily be explained as uh, metaphorical references. Of course, that metaf metaphorical reference becomes more difficult to explain in, in the case of Hadiths, which go into much greater uh, detail. Uh, and this is why it is important for Muslims to understand the distinction between the Quran, which is the word of God for Muslims, and uh, the Hadith, which uh, could have uh, um, uh, changed uh, in their narrations over time and sometimes even wholly invented to, so to support uh, the views of various factions who are arguing uh, theology in this way or, or that way. As for the, the attributes of God being uh, empty attributes uh, as uh, the Mu'tazilis uh, would have it, and you say that Muhammad Asad had the same view. Actually, I have not studied Muhammad Asad from that perspective, but you have given me reason to go back and study Muhammad Asad from that perspective. Um, uh, but that does not mean that in the end, I will still maintain the same uh, enthusiasm that I had for Muhammad uh, Asad, especially with re regards to this particular uh, view. Uh, Muhammad Asad is not my God, uh, neither is Jibril uh, um, uh, uh, Fuad Haddad, and though I respect these scholars, and, and I will continue to recommend their works for the good that their works contain, at the same time, I do not have to agree with them, I have to agree with the Word of God. And it's possible that they said some good things and some not so, so, so good things. And God is the final judge uh, of that. Uh, but Muslims are not committed. We say there is no God but God. We do not say that there is no God but Muhammad Asad or there is no God but uh, 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 J.F. Haddad. So I say that with the greatest uh, respect to the scholars. As for the Ashari scholars saying uh, that uh, God is uh, not he, uh, uh, God, God is, that the attributes of God are neither him uh, nor other than him, I think this is a very reasonable uh, position to take. And uh, as for the Quran uh, being the word of God, uh, Muslims believe, yes, the Quran is the word of God. Uh, but how? Uh, Imam al-Ghazali, uh, may God have uh, mercy on him, uh, put this uh, in the best way that I found in, in his book, Ihya Ulum al din which has become a very popular book uh, among Muslims uh, worldwide, though, of course, it has its detractors as well. Uh, but but he said that God's word uh, is without letters and sounds. So we must think of God's word as being a kind of internal speech, just like Yahweh uh, saying to himself, uh, should I tell Abraham uh, what I'm about to do in Genesis chapter 18? Uh, so there's a kind of internal dialogue that is going on in the mind of God. So that is the word of God, as I could best understand it. Uh, now, that word of God uh, is expressed in the Quran. And in that sense, Muslims say that the Quran is the word of God. Mind you, uh, the uh, you know Jews have said that the Torah is the word of God. And uh, Jews have even said that God uh, uh, created the universe according to the prescription of the Torah. So what is mentioned in the Torah comes before and the creation comes afterwards and the creation is aligned with what is already said in the in the Torah. So these are ways in which people have conceived of their books to be the word of God. Christians say that the New Testament is the word of God, uh, meaning that God so inspired uh, the writers to write. Some people had the idea of a verbal plenary uh, inspiration in which God dictates the very words which the uh, writers are to write, or, or even that the hands of the writers were moved to write precisely what God wanted them to write. So this is the word of God. Well, that comes from the mind of God. Now that mind of God, I must ask you, is that eternal or not? Is it God or is it not God? And when it is expressed in a book, is it still God or is it, still, or is it not God? You see, these are the kinds of questions which Muslims have had to try and answer. Uh, but none of these questions Muslims actually uh, prove that that uh, the, the, the Muslim uh, monotheism is not pure. Uh, for uh, Anthony, you would have to have a definition of monotheism uh, and a definition of pure monotheism, and and that definition of pure monotheism has to apply to Christianity as well. Otherwise, you would have to say, based on my definition of pure monotheism, Islam is not pure monotheism, and therefore Christianity is not pure monotheism either. 
But you must have a definition which fits both. On the one hand, it must show that Islam is not a pure monotheism. And at the same time, it must show that Christianity is a pure monotheism. Uh, and, and that I do not believe you can do. Uh, speaking of God's hands, uh, well, God created Adam with his own hands. Well, uh, I would explain that metaphorically. And I would say this is similar to God's statement in the Bible that uh, David is a man after God's own heart. It doesn't mean that God has a, a, a blood pumping organ in his body it means that david is very dear to god the way in which that was expressed in the quran is to say that god created adam with his own hands it doesn't mean that god actually has physical hands like we have in any case those muslim scholars who said uh, that uh, yes we must take these uh, statements as they are they said we're not going to explain how it is we're not even going to ask how it is god has hands yes but it's not like our hands we know that because the quran in 42 11 says nothing is like him uh, but at the same time we won't start asking how is that hand and nowadays of course we know there are many different kinds of hand uh, there is an arm that that reads an old lp uh, uh, record uh, that's called an arm but it's not like a human arm uh, and and when you speak of the arm of the lord in the bible uh, you shouldn't imagine that to be like a human arm of course people have imagined it that way and of course uh, god is shown to be corporeal in in the old testament uh, and also now in in the new testament uh, but uh, if you say that the corporeal corporeality of god is uh, is a proof that god is not uh, or the concept of God there is not monotheistic, well, then you have also disproved uh, Christianity uh, as being a monotheistic faith. But everyone would want to say that uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are three monotheistic faiths. What I have established, however, is that uh, Islam, in contrast with Judaism and Christianity, has uh, emphasized the strict monotheism, and that is a pure monotheism in which there is only one God, Allah, and no one else is to be worshipped or called upon or sacrificed to apart from Allah. Thank you all for your patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Reverend Rogers, you have your 15-minute rebuttal, and you're free to begin. Thank you, Dr. Ali. <clears throat> In my opening presentation, I pointed out that Islam's doctrine of God is far from pure, the pure monotheism it boasts of and is, in fact, in violation of its own criteria of what counts as pure monotheism. You'll notice that Shabir kept saying that we need a common definition of monotheism. The point that I'm making in this debate is that the Quran lays down its own criteria, and if the Quran violates that, then by its own stipulated definitions, it isn't what it boasts of, and therefore is completely false. But by way of response, notice that Shabir has unwittingly demonstrated this contention in a number of ways. In the first place, Shabir engaged in what is known in logic as a tu quo quo fallacy. That's where a person says, I don't have a problem because you have the same problem, or you have the problem, but to a greater degree, right? According to Shabir, we have the same problem as Christians. Well, remind me, what does Shabir believe the doctrine of the Trinity is? He believes it's shirk. Shabir has just told you that he has this, uh, we have the same problem he does. The problem of shirk? That's the very issue we're debating. Does Islam teach pure monotheism? Shabir's defense is, well, you have the same problem. As, as a Christians, we believe that uh, God came and in, in, became incarnate, right? We don't believe that God, as God, had uh, human attributes or qualities. It's not part of Christ's divine nature. But in Shabir, to justify the Quran and Sunnah's definition of Allah having these parts, he says, well, you have that problem too. Okay, we have that problem too. I don't think it's a problem. I'm, I'm not a Muslim. I don't reject the incarnation. I don't define that as a violation of anything that's true. That's what Islam teaches. So what I'm pointing out is Islam doesn't live up to its own criteria. It is internally contradictory, right? It leaves us from with a, a admission from Shabir that it doesn't teach pure monotheism and it doesn't teach anti-anthropomorphic uh, views about God. Now, uh, I don't agree with Shabir when he says that we have the same problem, by the way. Uh, perhaps it wasn't clear to Shabir in our previous debate. Now let me make it a bit more clear. Even though we're not debating the Trinity, I'm going to grant him this, this uh, favor. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity is not that there are three gods in addition to each other, like Muslims who have these attributes that are additional to each other and additional to the essence. The persons of the Trinity are numerically identical to the essence. 
They are consubstantial, subsistent relations. They co-inhere in the one essence. It's not that the Father has certain attributes and the Son has certain attributes in the Spirit. They possess the same divine identity, the same essence. So it's not the same thing. And when we say that God became a man, notice we're saying became a human being. Shabir, as a Muslim, if he is going to deal with these things as the early Muslims did, and as I think the sources clearly teach, has to say these things are true of Allah from all eternity. Allah from eternity has had a face. Allah from eternity has had hands, two right hands. Allah from eternity has, ha has uh, had loins or gonads or whatever term you choose to use for that. In fact, it's not just, notice, and I, I'm, again, I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm, I want people to see the truth of this, and I want Shabir to see it. I want other Muslims to see it. When you affirm these sorts of things for your deity, you're saying he's not God at all. A being who has these attributes or qualities can't even be the creator of heaven and earth. If he has hands, and I don't care what kind of hands you want to say, right? The, the hands of a clock or the hands of an arm on a, on a record player are different than the hands of my hands which are different from the hands of a, of a baboon. Okay, but in any case, any kind of hands that you're talking about presuppose a, a context within which they exist. They presuppose that sort of thing. We're told in various hadith, for example, that Allah put his palm between Muhammad's shoulder blades and Muhammad felt its coolness uh, in his chest. Allah put his hand between Muhammad's shoulder blades. That's about the extent of Allah's hand. Now, maybe it can blow up and become bigger, other things. But the fact is, it's circumscribed. It has limits. It presupposes space within which to exist. Allah then can't be the creator of space. Well, now, Shabir rejects this teaching of the early Muslims, the Muhadithun, the, the, Muhadithun, the traditionists who took these things literally. Right? And why did they take them literally, by the way? Uh, because, as I said, I didn't simply rely on the Hadith, right? but I also didn't reject the Hadith. I think I'm more of a Sunni than uh, apparently uh, Shabir is. I don't reject the Sunnah, the Sunnah of Muhammad, his Hadiths. Muhammad, uh, in Surah 3875, says Allah uh, uh, created Adam with his own two hands. This is what set Adam apart from every other creature. That's why the additional statements in the Hadith from Muhammad, uh, which we would expect to be more detailed. Anytime you have additional statements made, they're more detailed. That's not an argument against their veracity. Uh, we didn't even get an argument against their veracity, by the way. We just we, we heard that there were some people making up Hadith, and so you know we could just throw things out. Yeah, there were people making up Hadith. That's why we have Hadith collections like Sahih Bukhari saying we've applied this criteria and we've come to the conclusion that these are sound narrations. These are authoritative traditions. What evidence were we given not to trust these uh, traditions? Right Now, I would be happy with Shabir to throw out these Hadith, but guess what? The same Muslims who gave us the Hadith that Shabir says we can just throw out because they're unreliable and they made things up, those are the same people that handed down the Quran to us. Okay, let's throw them out. We don't. We shouldn't trust them. They're a bunch of fabricators. Okay, throw out the Quran along with it. I, I'd be happy with that. I would consider that a a, a good resolution of our uh, discussion, our uh, debate. Now, uh, uh, but what about that stuff about Allah's hands? I mean, is that just metaphorical? Again, uh, the Hadith say this is Adam's distinguishing, uh, you know, quality. He was created by Allah's hands. The Hadith go on and and emphasize this even more. That's why the early traditionists uh, said this. Now, he doesn't accept Assad's view, where you just divest Allah of all his attributes, which was also the view of the Mu'atizali and the Jahmiya and all the others. Uh, he, he rejects that, and I'm happy he does so, but that doesn't get him out of the problem. My whole point was all three of these positions are problems. The position of the early uh, traditionists, that Allah has attributes, including loins and two right hands and a foot and a shin and so forth, that was a problem because it means Allah is made up of parts, including parts that presuppose a spatio-temporal environment in which he exists, and so couldn't be the creator of that. I, but uh, And also the, the Ashari resolution of that, Shabir says he has no problem with that. It's not a problem to say Allah's attributes are not he and not other than he. Well, my goodness, that's the very definition of a logical contradiction. It, it violates one of the most basic fundamental laws of thought. In fact, Hamza Yusuf, an Orthodox Sunni Muslim, in his uh, book uh, on the creed of Imam al-Tahawi, admits that this statement of, uh, of al-Ashari, that his attributes are not he and not other than he, he says that it's a paradox, and he says, in effect, what the Muslim has to do is square a circle in his mind. He's advocating this. I can assure you, folks, anybody who thinks he's squaring circles is not being rational. He's engaging, in, by definition, in irrationality. So no, I do not believe that Islam teaches pure monotheism, not in any sense, not in any of these three ways. 
Uh, and, and I don't think that al Ashari's resolution is a sound one. Now, again, go back to the notion that uh, now all Muslims, by the way, except for the Mu'athizali, believe that the Quran is eternal. Let's just stick with that as an example. Forget Allah's two right hands. Forget his shin. Forget his loins. Forget the fact that there was a primordial womb that reached up and grabbed Allah's loins, according to Sahih Bukhari, three times. Forget that it's also found in Ahmed bin Hanbal's Musnad, volume 14. Forget all of that. Okay, forget that unsightly business. And by the way, it is unsightly business because even if you look at the English translations of Muhammad Mushin Khan and others, they completely strike this from the English. They're embarrassed by this uh, appropriately. But forget all that. Just consider the Quran for a moment. The Quran is not Allah, according to Muslims. It's something other than Allah. It's not the creator, but it wasn't created. There's another eternal thing besides their deity. Folks, that is not pure monotheism. It is not pure monotheism, and it's not what Christians mean when we say that Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus is not something other than the Creator. He is the Creator. We don't believe that He's an additional thing in addition to the Father. They share the same divine essence. But in Islam, these attributes are something other than the essence. They're not the same thing. So, no, we don't have the same problem. Yes, Muslims do have this problem, and uh, that's why I call it shirk, shorn, or sham. You're either guilty of shirk, asserting a, a plurality for your deity, including anthropomorphic qualities like loins, or you have to divest your deity of all attributes, in which case he becomes an unknowable being and certainly not an object of worship, or you have to engage in self-contradiction in order to pacify yourself and pretend that you're not really in, uh, violating your own criteria, uh, your own belief system. Okay? This is not simply a problem that can be swept away. And it's certainly, you know, it's, it's no answer to the problem. If, if, I'm, if I'm in a boat that's and somebody says your boat is sinking, and I say, oh, yeah, well, your boat's sinking too. Uh, well, that doesn't help me at all. You know, uh, I need a life raft. Somebody get me out of here. I'll tell you how you can get out of here. Confess the only true triune God who revealed himself through the prophets and the apostolic writings. That God is absolutely one in his essence. All three persons possess the divine essence, holy, without partition, without division. That's the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity. Okay? That's not, again, that's not something I made up uh, and so forth. That, that's what Christians have always believed. Christians have always believed that uh, God is one in essence. Okay? I know there have been heresies throughout history. Uh, but those heresies have been definitively responded to by Christians. Um, as a reminder, Shabir said, you know, what constitutes shirk is thinking that there are other beings that can be interceded through. Well, remember, I quoted the Hadith. We heard no response to this, that the Quran is going to be an intercessor for Muslims. And this is, I'm, I'm, I'm being, you know, entirely charitable here. Magnus, the Quran is only one of the many things that are going to intercede for Muslims on the day of resurrection. But Shabir admitted that that's shirk. Okay, so here you have an eternal thing that's going to intercede for Muslims. He's going to appear as a pale man, we're told, according to the Hadith. So a pale man is going to intercede for Muslims, an eternal thing. Right? He, he said that Christians have the additional problem because we believe in a plurality of persons, right? Doesn't this sound to you like a person? The Quran is a pale man interceding for people? And even if it's not a person, do you remember how Shabir broke down different positions regarding theism? He spoke about henotheism. He spoke about monolatry. And then he spoke about monotheism. Mon monotheism is belief in one God. What is henotheism? It's a belief in additional eternal things besides the one God, but only worshiping one. So pretend that Muslims do only worship one of these eternal entities. That's not pure monotheism, even by Shabir's definition. It's henotheism. But just because they don't call uh, a cat a cat doesn't mean that it's not. The fact that they don't say they worship the Quran or these other attributes doesn't mean they don't. If they can be uh, used to intercede with Allah, then it does constitute shirk. The Quran chided the pagans for this very view. Muhammad in the Quran chided the pagans repeatedly for thinking that there were intercessory deities who could avail with Allah. Well, that's the very thing Muslims are saying. When they say the Quran is eternal, it can be an intercessor. And remember, it's not just the Quran. It's every single one of Allah's attributes. All of them are viewed as hypostatic entities that exist in addition to each other, in addition to the divine essence. I know some of this can seem 
uh, abstract and philosophical and so forth. But, but I hope you understand, this is the sort of challenge that Muslims for centuries have made against Christianity. And they've gotten away colossal, I mean, with murder, really. Because it's not Christians who have the problem here. Christians do not set up these faulty standards of what counts as true monotheism. And we don't set up absurd answers to try and get out of the conundrum. Allah's attributes are not he and not other than he. We don't have to reject our own sources because they're so embarrassing. We don't have to try and cover up unsightly business about Allah's loins. We don't have to do that sort of thing. We are confident in embracing our sources. I entirely embrace all those passages that talk about Jesus becoming a man and dying a humiliating, agonizing death. I know that for Muslims, that's scandalous, but isn't that what the New Testament says? That it's a stumbling block to unbelievers? Well, that's what I believe as a Christian. That's what God did. But God had to do that. Don't forget this. God had to do that. He had to take a human nature on himself. He didn't always have hands. He didn't always have loins. He didn't always have a shin. And by the way, I mean, some of this gets pretty, and I, again, I'm not trying to be uh, offensive, some of this gets downright uh, absurd because many of these Muslims who take these things literally will say that the sources don't even, they don't, you might be assuming Allah has two legs or two feet. No, the, the Muslims who take this stuff literally say Allah has one shin. He has one shin, just like he has two right hands. The, the Islamic sources lead them to these sorts of beliefs. But even if you take all of this away, again, the point I keep hammering, you're still left with an affirmation of a plurality of attributes that are in addition to Allah's essence. They're not his essence. They're something other than the essence. The Quran, if I were to hold it up here, the Quran, all, none of you would say it's Allah. Shabir would not say it's Allah. But he would have to confess that it's eternal and uncreated, like Allah. The Quran says to Christians, say not three. I say to Muslims, say not two. In fact, again, the Quran is only one of his attributes. They say Allah has 99 names, so at least 99 corresponding attributes. Say not 99. We've got a worse problem than Muslims. Say not 99. I'll say three all day long, as long as Muslims are saying 99 and calling my belief in the Trinity polytheism. Okay? And I'll conclude with that. My time is up. Thank you, Reverend Rogers. We're going to move to our last debut, um, rebuttal phase and then to closing arguments. So we're going to have a rebuttal phase by each of our participants of 10 minutes each. And we will begin with you, Dr. Ali. Thank you. Sure. So, Anthony, thank you again. And I still find myself chuckling. Um, but on a more serious note, I find that you have misrepresented what I said. I didn't say that the mere fact of an intercession would uh, imply shirk. I said that uh, no one can intercede except with God's permission. So if, for example, God gives the permission to the Prophet Jesus or to the Prophet Muhammad, uh, on whom be peace, or to the Quran, if that could be personalized in, in, in language, uh, then uh, and, and then one of these uh, intercedes uh, with God's permission. That is not shirk. I didn't say that that is shirk. So you've misrepresented what I said. Uh, secondly, uh, you seem to have given your own definition of henotheism. Uh, I quickly looked it up and I found in the Oxford definitions that henotheism is the adherence to one particular God out of several, especially by a family tribe or other group. I, I didn't find your definition, so I would like to know where you got your definition from. Uh, did you just make it up on the spot in order to uh, you know, make a thing true by definition because you wanted to show that Islam is not true and so you want to say whatever Islam is, that is henotheism, and you make up henotheism's definition as you as you go. Now, as for the Quran being eternal, uh, the uh, Muslims do not worship the Quran. And if you held up the Quran, Anthony, and if you ask me, is this uh, eternal? Uh, I would say what you're holding in your hands uh, in terms of pages uh, and ink, that is not eternal. But I would say that what Muslim scholars have called eternal is the thought of God, 
and and that thought of God is to a certain express uh, uh, to a certain extent expressed in the written Quran uh, that we have or the recited Quran as we recite it. So there is a distinction there, and and it's not it has to be that, that you know an exclusive uh, without a middle. Uh, it, it could be that uh, there is something that we we speak about. It's somehow associated with God, and it is not correct either to say that it is not God or to say that it is God. God because that, uh, yes that is a paradox and uh, uh, Christians uh, have a worse paradox in that if you say you cannot square a circle well how do you make Jesus God and man at the same time to be God he has to have the mind of God to be man he has to have the mind of man and if he has a mind of man who knows that he is God at the same time then he's not really a, a, a man he because uh, no man knows that he is God uh, and and so you have here an inherent paradox, a much bigger paradox uh, than we have. And no, it's not uh, a two coke fallacy uh, where you know I'm saying that uh, okay we have a problem, but you have a bigger problem. I'm saying we don't have a problem. I'm saying this is not a problem. It is something that has been discussed variously by Muslim scholars. Uh, the Ashari scholars have uh, reached a very reasonable uh, explanation of many of these things. I myself, in my own mind, have reached a very uh, reasonable explanation and understanding of uh, these issues as much as I am capable uh, given my humble um, uh, position as, as a, a student of the faith. Uh, but I'm saying that if you think that these are problems, then why do you not think that it is a problem that you have this inherent contradiction that Jesus is God and man at the same time? Why do you not think that it is a problem that God is one and three at the same time? And if you say that this is a problem that you have this multiplicity of attributes, 99 of them, well, you have 99 times three. Oh, yes, it's the same attribute sh shared by the three. But notice that one of them was able to leave aside his attribute of knowledge so that when Jesus came into the world, he said, of that time and hour, no one knows, not even the Son. Uh, Mark chapter 13, verse number 32. So if Jesus so divested himself, emptied himself, as the Carmen Christi says in Philippians chapter 2, then uh, how, how does the attribute exist apart from God? Or how does God exist apart from his attribute? How does one of the divine persons exist apart from his attribute? And if corporality, corporeality is a problem and you don't want to give uh, room for metaphor, then how do you take Paul's statement, which you quoted in our earlier debate today, where Paul says that Jesus was that rock that was accompanying the people in, in the desert. So Jesus was once a rock. And now he's a human being. You say that God did not have hands before he became uh, in, in, in incorporeal in, in Jesus. Well, uh, how do you explain in the Old Testament that God was there eating uh, with Abraham and uh, walking in the garden in the cool of the day? Uh, and, and so on. Uh, so certainly uh, anthropomorphic representation of God in, in the Bible uh, is, is a problem. And that is, in fact, a real problem uh, because not uh, only does the Bible speak of God's hand and, and shin and, and these minor references, which can be explained uh, metaphorically in reference to the Quran, uh, but uh, it speaks of God in, in more great detail. Um, and uh, I, 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 I mean, I would have hesitated to say certain things in this debate, especially since this is being broadcast in the church. Uh, but uh, um, Anthony, you make reference to loins and gonads and so on. So you are expanding my, my thought about what's possible uh, in a church uh, situation. So allow me then uh, to introduce this book uh, that is entitled, uh, as you can see, uh, gods, uh, and, and you know the rest. Uh, and uh, the uh, subtitle I'll read out for you because that's in smaller print. It says, and other problems for men and monotheism, uh, written by a university professor who is also a Jewish uh, rabbi. His name is Howard Eilberg uh, Schwartz. I think this is worth uh, uh, reading. One of the things he points out is that uh, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 16, uh, God speaks of Israel, of course, uh, using metaphors and uh, speaking of Israel as his uh, wife, uh, but also describes uh, Israel as a young girl who is growing up uh, now for the first time develops uh, breasts and now she is ready and and then God uh, lays his cloak spreads his cloak over her uh, reminding us of the same language which is used in describing the encounter between uh, Ruth and uh, Boaz uh, and, and we know what happened there uh, so uh, of course this is all um, metaphorical 
God did not really lay with a woman. Uh, but for God to describe it in this way, what does it say about God's thinking? So isn't this attributing to the mind of God not only a, a physical body, which other passages do, but doesn't this particular passage attribute to the mind of God the kind of thinking uh, that we know to be expressed by, by drinking bodies when they uh, boast about their sexual exploits. Uh, that, that's an interesting thing for you to uh, think about and to uh, comment on. Uh, so uh, the last thing I want to say here is about uh, Hadith. Uh, since uh, a, a lot of what you have quoted is from Hadith about God's uh, this and, and that, uh, I, I want to clarify that, uh, no, you're not a better Sunni by accepting all hadiths uh, hook, line, and sinker. Uh, the earliest uh, uh, people of uh, our Muslim community, uh, for example, Aisha, the mother of the believers, uh, rejected certain, certain hadiths that did not uh, make sense uh, because she knew that hadiths are being traded from one person to another by word of mouth. Anyone can change something. People can report something by mistake. And of course, people can even invent things. Uh, so to, uh, to, to accept Except all hadiths is not really the Sunni position. This is, in fact, a later Sunni position, and you will find it uh, to be widely represented. But when one searches our history, one will find that the earliest generations of Muslims, they had one book. So that even the hadith says that uh, God uh, uh, is leaving uh, through the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, a legacy of a book, which is the Quran. And uh, later on, people changed that to mean two things, the book and uh, the Sunnah. Uh, and, and hence from that, we get the name Sunni. But the name Sunni itself uh, means, yes, we follow the way of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But that does not mean that we follow each and every hadith. Uh, in modern times, there have been a kickback over that uh, ossification of thought with regards to the hadith and many books have been published uh, to say that we need to reevaluate the, the hadiths and uh, we need to differentiate between the wheat and the shaif. Uh, uh, a book I can recommend in this regard is the one by Asrar Ahmad Khan, uh, Authentication of the Hadith, uh, uh, Revisiting the, the Principles or something to that e effect. So when we study the hadiths in detail, we realize then that uh, hadiths are valuable for giving Muslims details of our practices, the kinds of details which people uh, were more likely to remember, like the details of our prayer because they prayed every day and they prayed in public so they knew how the prayer was done in detail. And that is needed for us because without that, we wouldn't be able to have the detailed prayers as we have uh, now. Uh, but when it comes to theology, the theology should come from the Quran. And you said rightly, the Quran lays down its own criteria, but it's not the Quranic criteria that says that God cannot be a corporeal being. So you're using criteria that you have de derived outside uh, of the Quran. And uh, in, in some, I would say that Islam is pure monotheism and there's no problem in the Islamic view. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Reverend Rogers, you can begin your 10 minute rebuttal. Thank you very much. Shabir began by saying that I misdefined henotheism, but then he gave the very definition that I was working in terms of. Henotheism is not a rejection of other gods. It's the insistence or affirmation of, of, the, of the existence. And oh, uh, actually, I have the same definition I think that he had. It's the worship of a single overarching god while not denying the existence or possible existence of other deities. Well, what is it to say that there are other things in addition to Allah that are eternal and uncreated? That's what most people mean by a deity. And it's certainly not absolute unity. If you say that there are a multiplicity of subsistent things, entities, in addition to Allah, such as the Quran and all the other 99 plus attributes of Allah, you are affirming henotheism, at least henotheism. That is not pure monotheism by any definition. Now, Shabir has said uh, on the one hand that he believes that this the, the resolution come to or arrived at by Ashtaris uh, is a paradox. He says it's a paradox. We got to deal with this. But then he turns around and he says, I, I believe this is a very reasonable explanation. I don't think he even knows what the definition of paradox is. The whole point of a, to say something's a paradox is to say I haven't got a reasonable resolution of this. And my point wasn't that this is merely a paradox. My point is that this is a flagrant contradiction. You can't say uh, the Quran is something other than Allah and not other than Allah. That is not rationally coherent. 
And as soon as you start thinking that that sort of thing is, I can assure you, you're going to have all sorts of other problems. You know, thieves have a tendency to think this way. This is not my wallet. It's not the case that it's not my wallet, right? That's how thieves think, right? That is not rational thinking. It's criminal thinking. And it's criminal, especially when we talk about God. If you're going to reason that way, uh, then you're admitting that your position uh, is, is terribly flawed and altogether false. Now, I already explained to uh, Shabir that this isn't the same issue that Christians have. He keeps going back to this. As a Christian, I don't believe, I mean, he said 99 times 3, right? 99 attributes, because each person has these attributes. As Christians, we do not believe that the Son possesses different attributes of the Father that can be added to the Father's attributes. And this is just gross uh, straw man of the Christian position. Shabir, in our earlier debate, quoted the Athanasian Creed. He quoted other creeds. He quoted the Nicene Creed, which says the Son is homoousius, one essence, the same essence. Not, not the Son possesses the same kind of essence, like you possess human nature, you possess human nature, but you're numerically other than the other person, essentially. No, the persons of the Trinity possess the entirety of the divine essence. They're not partitioned. They're not divided. All three persons co-inhere in the one divine essence. This is not the same thing as you find in Islam. And, and Shabir says, well, we've got a problem because we say that Jesus became a man. Yeah, I affirm that. I say Jesus became a man. He has not always been a man. And his humanity is not the same as his deity. And he misrepresented at least what I believe as an Orthodox Protestant and what even, uh, you know, the, the whole Western and Eastern Church, apart from, you know, later Protestantism has always believed, completely misrepresented uh, this when he said, that uh, as Christians, we believe Jesus gave up one of his attributes and so forth. There might be some who have said that. It's certainly not what I would say. When Jesus in Mark 13, 32 says, no man knows the day or the hour, not the angels uh, in heaven, nor the son, but the father alone. I take the word know there according to its declarative sense, its causative meaning. In other words, Jesus is saying, I don't declare that day. That prerogative belongs to the father. That term is used that way repeatedly in the Old Testament and even in the New in 1 Corinthians 2, Paul said to the Corinthians, I resolved to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. Was Paul saying he literally didn't know other things? No, he's saying this is what I'm declaring to you. What Jesus is referring to there is the wedding custom in, in uh, Jewish culture where it was the prerogative of a father to declare the day the son would go get his bride. It didn't mean the son didn't literally cognitively know that day, but he didn't know it in the sense of have the prerogative to declare it. That's how that term is used. That's how I understand it. I also think it was a misrepresentation of Philippians 2 to say the son divested himself of the attribute of knowledge. Philippians 2 doesn't say that. Philippians 2 says existing, who parkon. It, it means that he continued to exist in the form of God, even when he humbled himself and took on the nature of a servant. He didn't get rid of anything. He added something. He added a human nature. So he didn't device, divest himself of a single attribute. What about God even under the Old Testament? Uh, speaking of himself using human terms. I didn't reject that. I already anticipated it in my opening presentation. My opening presentation, I said as a Christian, I uh, adamantly affirm that the God of the Bible can condescend and enter into his creation and appear in palpable ways to his creatures. But the Bible is clear that God, apart from these condescensions, doesn't have these characteristics or qualities. God is spirit, according to Scripture, John 4, 24. God is present in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, Psalm 139. God fills heaven and earth, Jeremiah 23. That's the nature of God, according to the Bible. These other things are talking about God voluntarily condescending and appearing, a theophanic appearance. That's not what's happening in Islam. Muslims say Allah can't enter into his creation. How many times have you all heard that from Muslims? He can't enter into his creation. So there is no condescension on Allah's part. When the Quran, not just the Hadith, when the Quran says Allah has eyes, it's referring to, uh, uh, you know, it's referring to what Allah is from eternity. It's not a condescension. It says that Allah has eyes. It says that Allah has a face that can be seen. Surah 75, 22 through 23 says, some faces will be radiant on that day looking at their Lord. So people are going to see Allah. Well, here's a question for you. If people are going to see Allah on the day of resurrection, are they going to see all of him or only part of him? If they could see all of him, then that would mean they're infinite, wouldn't it? If, if their vision could encompass him, which would make them gods, which would be what? Sure. If they say they won't see all of Allah, they'll only see part of him, what does that mean? It means Allah consists of parts. He's not absolutely one. What do you call that? Shirk. 
Allah has partners no matter how you slice and dice it. Allah is not absolutely one, not according to the Quran, not, not according to the Hadith. Now, again, I have to call Shabir out on not being a good Sunni. Shabir says uh, that I'm just wrong. You know, he can reject Hadith and so forth. The people who say you can reject certain Hadith say there are criteria for this. Okay, What are the criteria to reject the Hadith that I've referred to? The, a number of the Hadith, when I referred to the, the Hadith of intercession going to uh, uh, Adam because he was created directly with Allah's hands, which Shabir says, oh, yeah, that, that teaches he has hands, you know, so we throw that out. Uh, that hadith is mass narrated. It's a mutawatir hadith. It's one of the strongest hadiths you can find. The hadith that I mentioned about Allah's loins, that hadith is found in uh, Sahih Bukhari, number 6830, 6831, 6832. It's found in Ahmed's Musnad. There are four separate chains of transmitters. Okay? If these people are unreliable, then throw out the Quran along with it. Okay? We need criteria to just say, you know, uh, that this is reliable, that's not reliable. Uh, I, I don't accept this. And he said, you know, he says, uh, Aisha, for example, rejected certain hadith. How does he know what uh, Aisha did? Isn't he presupposing that he can rely on the hadith that tell us that she rejected certain things? Over and over again, I mean, I think that Islam has to uh, desperately do certain things in order to avoid an obvious conundrum. Their religion does not teach pure monotheism. And why doesn't it? Why doesn't it? Because it's a departure from what was taught by the prophets and the apostles. The Quran says, if this Quran were from someone other than Allah, Surah 4, you'd find in it much contradiction. I found much contradiction. Because it's not from Allah. It's not from the true God. The one they call Allah. The true God revealed himself through the prophets and apostles. That God is triune. That God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we especially heard earlier. Again, I, I, I think that the Islamic sources reduce Muslims to one of three options. Either you say that Allah has a plurality of attributes, which is shirk, or you reject Allah's attributes in order to say that uh, you don't believe in the plurality, but then you end up with uh, a deity that's undefinable and unknowable, and therefore not even worship. I mean, how can you worship such a being? Uh, and by the way, how's that any different from the non-existent? The un non-existent is undefinable, unknowable, right? What, what is the non-existent? It has no qualities, no attributes. Well, then maybe Allah is simply non-existent. Okay? This is not pure monotheism, right? And the Asherite solution to this is not a solution. When, when uh, Hamza Yusuf said it's a paradox, and other Muslims, Shabir said it's a paradox. It is not a paradox. It's a contradiction, okay? He said that we're squaring the circle, right? We're trying to say that Jesus has these contradictory things. No, 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 no. As Christians, we say Jesus is both God and man, two distinct natures. When I say that Christ has the attributes of God and the attributes of deity, I'm not positing them of the same thing. His divine nature is not his human nature. When I say that Christ is a divine person uh, and ha having a divine nature is omniscient and omnibenevolent and omnipotent and omniscient or uh, omnipresent, I'm referring to his eternal divine nature. I'm not saying that nature is both present and not present, and vice versa for the human nature of Christ. And I'll conclude with that. Thank you, Reverend Rogers. Now we're going to go to closing statements. We have five minutes from each of our panelists. And Dr. Ali, you can begin. So finally, folks, as we come to the end of uh, our discussion tonight, I want to draw together the various uh, strands of this discussion and point out that uh, Anthony is uh, really criticizing Islam for something that is inherent in the monotheistic faiths, so in Judaism, in Christianity, and Islam. Uh, conceive for a moment of a Christian who does not accept the Trinity. The Christian thinks that there is only one God. Uh, well, that Christian has to answer some of the same questions that Muslim theologians have been uh, uh, discussing. Uh, what about God's attributes? Uh, is this the plurality within God, or how do you explain that? Uh, and, the, and the Christian will explain that within the context of Christian Unitarianism or Christian monotheism. Uh, and, and this would not be a, a huge problem. It would definitely not mean that the Christians who are contemplating this or puzzled over it are non-monotheists uh, or that they are not pure monotheists because of this. Now, it, we, we think about the Trinity and you realize that with the Trinity, you have three persons. So there is this uh, plurality within the one person of God, uh, the one being of God that we understand. But then you have the same problem that each one of the persons, 
the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have these attributes. And even if you say they share the attributes, how do you explain that one of them left the attribute of knowledge and uh, you say, well, oh, well, let's, let's redefine the word know and say that it means declare. And certainly you can find another a verse in the Bible where the word is used that way. Well, you can find another uh, verse in the Bible where no is used in the in the sense of sexual intercourse. But but which uh, pa which meaning applies in this particular verse? Uh, clearly, Jesus is uh, declaring his uh, uh, lack of knowledge about when the day of judgment will occur, and he's saying that only the Father knows that. Uh, it's not only that the Father alone will declare that, but if Jesus Himself was God, He would have the full prerogative. So too would be the, the Holy Spirit. But why would it be a prerogative of the Father only? The only explanation for that is that the Father is the only God. The Holy Spirit is uh, a, a sort of expression of God in, in the world. And the Son, uh, that if this refers to Jesus, is a subordinate person. He is a human being and a servant and messenger uh, of God. So yeah, Christians would have the same problem, but even more, because not only does this uh, the question of knowledge comes up, but in, in the case of the second person of the Holy Trinity, it is said that he died on the cross. So that means he's giving up life, which for Muslims is an essential attribute of God. So if it is possible for the second person of the Holy Trinity to give up his life, uh, that would mean that life is not an essential attribute of, of any one of the person. It means that the second person of the Holy Trinity is expendable. And by definition, Muslims would say that God is not expendable. The Quran says, uh, He is alive and uh, and he does not die. Uh, so, so this is a very strange uh, response from uh, Anthony to say that, no, there is no um, a paradox uh, there when it comes to uh, Christianity. Uh, I do believe that the Quran is the true word of God, and this is what explains the Quran's uh, emphasis on monotheism, which uh, has been uh, a goal of the Old and New Testaments, but unfortunately, the Old and New Testaments got tainted with polytheism that was rampant in the uh, milieus in which the writers of the Old and New Testaments uh, operated, and it is the Quran that gives us that uh, pure monotheism. As for the uh, saying that there are some mutawatir hadith, uh, that's very questionable. I think uh, Anthony is just going by what some Muslims say, but uh, mo most Muslim scholars will tell you uh, that uh, the number of mutawatir hadiths are very few, and sometimes some people claim that this hadith is mutawatir, and some other scholars say, no, it is not. It looks like people just champion the hadiths that they want to prove a point with, and they say that this is mutawatir without it necessarily being uh, so. So I'm not denying that God has hands, but the, uh, the Quran, of course, says, uh, speaks of the hands of God. But I'm saying that uh, we can explain this in two ways. One is to say that he has hands, but we don't know what those hands uh, refer to exactly, because there could be many different things that are called hands. And the other way is to say, well, it just refers to the power of God. When we say that God's hand is with you, it is referring to the power uh, of God and not necessarily to a physical uh, hands. Now, the uh, Philippians 2 just uh, does say that uh, uh, Jesus emptied himself uh, and uh, found himself in the form of a servant. So this is a problem, I think, for Christianity in that uh, God does have attributes which he can give up. And uh, in the Old Testament, Moses saw the back part of God and his God's hand was covering the crevice in which uh, Moses uh, remained. So you cannot say that God did not have these physical attributes in the Old Testament. I thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Well, that concludes our closing statement. Can you please uh, applaud for our panelists tonight? I am sure we are all grateful to them for doing both of these discussions. It requires an immense amount of work on both of their parts, as you can probably surmise. So thank you, gentlemen. We're now going to move to a, a question and Wait, answer phase. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm moving ahead here. All right. <laughs> All right, Reverend Rogers, take your, your five minutes, and then we'll go to our question and answer format. So, gentlemen, just remember, we get to question and answers. The two minutes, we're going to go very fast on that, but we'll address that again. Mr. Rogers, your five-minute closing statement. Thank you. Okay, what have we seen in this debate? Well, we've seen a number of logical fallacies. The two quo fallacy. Yeah, I've got a problem, but you've got it too. Maybe even worse than I do. 
I've answered that numerous times now, and Shabir, in the uh, response to me, has engaged in another fallacy, or at least what would be called a propaganda technique, to merely reassert the original claim that I refuted. Okay? The doctrine of the Trinity does not mean what he's talking about. And I've already said that numerous times, so I don't need to repeat it. The doctrine of the Incarnation does not mean what he said. He tried to come back and say, no, the Son doesn't have knowledge, uh, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean declare, uh, it's not being used in the declarative sense there. But notice that was an assertion. He didn't give you an argument, he gave you an assertion. That's a propaganda technique. Okay? When somebody asserts something and pretends that because they've asserted it many times and very forcefully, that makes it true. Well, no, that doesn't make it true. Right? It might work in commercials, but it shouldn't work in rational debate. Okay? The reason that I said it means that, I gave you a reason, contextually it's talking about Jesus returning for his bride. In a Jewish wedding uh, context, it was a father who declared, made known a day or the day that the son would go for his bride. Okay? That's how Jesus is using the term there. That's the context, going for his bride. So we've seen two Kulkwe fallacy. We've heard the straw man fallacy. We've also seen that... Uh, uh, you know, that Islam's answer or solution to this problem is really, uh, it reduces to absurdity. The, another logical fallacy, a reductio ad absurdum, where a person, in order to try and get out of a problem, will ad in, adopt something that's rationally incoherent. It is rationally incoherent to say that Allah's attribute, like the Quran, is not Allah, and yet it's not other than Allah. What is it? If it's not the Creator, what is it? It's something other than the Creator. If it's something other than the Creator, what is it? Well, it's not Allah, but it's eternal. Where did this eternal thing come from if it's not Allah? And, and what about all of its other partners? The Quran has partners, like seeing. Supposedly, according to the uh, early traditionists, Allah's attribute of seeing can be present. His eyes are somehow here, while Allah's somewhere else. His eyes are gallivanting in places that Allah wouldn't. That's not, folks, pure monotheism. It's pure shirk. It's a violation of the very things that the Quran says uh, constitutes pure monotheism. Uh, he said that hands could be meant literally, or they could simply be metaphorical for Allah's power. Well, how is that for a clear revelation of God? He's not sure if it's metaphorical or literal. Well, I'm sure that it's literal, but either way, I, I still have a problem with this. I'm sure that it's literal because that's how the Quran uses it in Surah 3875 with respect to the hands, for example and the Hadith, which we have no reason to reject, and all good evidence uh, in, in support of them to affirm. He said that, you know, the Hadith aren't, mut the, the ones I cited aren't mutawatir. But go look it up. They're, they're mutawatir. They're, you know, it's hard to find another Hadith that is, is as plentifully narrated as this one, the Hadith of intercession, where it talks about Allah's hands and Adam being created with Allah's hands. Uh, we're told, in fact, that according to Surah 7, that Allah brought forth from Adam's uh, back his progeny, Right, and caused them to stand before him. Before we were ever made, we were all brought out of Adam's back. Allah stroked uh, Adam's back according to the Quran and Hadith and took out these progenies. So uh, Allah stroked Adam's back with his hand. Right, These things are quite literal, and, it's, and, and these are, are, are well established. I do agree that there has to be criteria for what we accept or reject. That's, that's the criteria that goes into forming Sahih Bukhari. It's called Sahih for a reason, because they applied the criteria. We didn't hear any good reason to reject these particular hadiths from Shabir. I think the Quran violates these uh, the, its own standards in numerous ways, no matter how you cut it. Even if we reject this notion that these things are to be understood literally, uh, that he literally has hands, uh, two right hands or loins, I think those are literal. The early Muslims thought they were literal. Salafi Muslims to this day think they're literal. Okay, Even if you get rid of that, you're still saying that there are a multiplicity of attributes in addition to Allah's essence, these eternal things that exist that he didn't make. There are as many exceptions, G.F. Haddad said, there are as many exceptions to the statement Allah created everything as there are attributes. Those attributes weren't created. And you can intercede with Allah through them and they'll appear on the day of judgment and intercede for you. Okay? Shabir says this has to be granted by Allah. Okay, so we have eternal entities like the Quran that are going to appear as a pale man that Allah has granted the right of intercession. What pagan at the time of Muhammad wouldn't have said the same thing? They all believed that these gods were subordinate to Allah and that he was the one who granted them the right of intercession. And I'll conclude with that. My time is up. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Okay, now let's give him a proper round of applause.
for all your hard work that you got for us. All right, gentlemen, this next round is going to go pretty fast, as you know, in this in this format. Two minutes and one minute are going to go by very quick. I'm going to ask a question to one of our two panelists. That person will have two minutes to respond to the question. The other panelist will have a one minute rebuttal. So uh, gentlemen, again, these times are going to be rather short and go fast. And I'm going to rely on my timekeeper here so we can keep on track. Our first question is going to go to Dr. Ali. And the question is this, if Muhammad is not divine, why are blasphemy laws enforced against those who criticize him? Well, these blasphemy laws, I believe, have uh, arisen by mistake in, in Muslim thinking uh, because the Quran itself shows that uh, people blasphemed in the presence of the Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace, but uh, no uh, such laws were applied against them. The Quran, in fact, refers to this again and again and says that uh, the, this is the nature of prophets. Prophets are sent. Uh, there are enemies uh, of the prophets, and they will try to inspire each other with uh, blasphemous phrases that sound good, uh, but uh, leave this all to God and, and God is enjoining upon the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him to remain patient in the sight uh, of such provocation and uh, it, it's a travesty that uh, uh, in Muslim um, um, uh, jurisprudence it came to be uh, regarded uh, as a, a punishable law in, in this a punishable act in this uh, world uh, but at the same time I must uh, uh, say that uh, this does not mean that Muslims are regarding the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him as God himself uh, in a weird way of thinking uh, Muslims uh, can explain it in this way they can say all right uh, God is uh, you know beyond reproach people can say anything they cannot really hurt God God after all is God but Muhammad is a man like us and if you say something against him he is vulnerable like we are and, uh, and, and Muslims have come out of their love for the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They have come to think of defending him in, in these ways. But of course, uh, if we want to defend the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we have to defend him in the right way by representing his correct teachings in our lives, by performing random acts of kindness uh, based on which people will come to understand what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught his followers that we're still practicing to this day and uh, to react violently uh, or with such strong emotion is not going to come across very well. It will not be a proper representation of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his noble teachings. Thank you. You have a one-minute rebuttal. Yeah, I think the logic of Muslims uh, that Muhammad is not to be blasphemed because in their eyes he really is set up as a partner of Allah in certain ways. I think that that follows from, I didn't bring up things about Muhammad, uh, that I could have in this debate. But for example, throughout the Quran, Allah is referred to as most kind, most merciful, repeatedly in the Quran. These are his attributes. And Muslims say, if you give his attributes to a creature, you're committing shirk. Well, one of the final revelations of the Quran, take these attributes and apply them to Muhammad. Surah 9, uh, 127 through 28 of the Quran refers to Muhammad as most kind, most merciful which Muslims say is shirk in every other case, but here they are, the final revelations of the Quran. Right? Even Muslims like Rashad Khalifa tell you that these verses can't possibly be part of the Quran because they constitute shirk. Right? That's why Muslims are running around killing people for blaspheming Muhammad, because they really do exalt him to the position of a deity. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. We have our next question, which will be for you, Reverend Rogers. The question is this. John 14, 28, how can Jesus Christ be equal with God? When Jesus declares God is greater than him, the Trinity cannot be true. Yeah, remember what the Christian belief is. John 1, 1 says the word was God, so by nature deity. John 1, 14 says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we have to affirm two things concerning Jesus. According to John's testimony, the same John who records John 14, we have to affirm that he's deity and that he has true humanity. In terms of his deity, Jesus is equal with the Father. That's explicitly stated in the same gospel in John 5, 18. He had equality with God. That's why the Jews wanted to kill him. So when Jesus in John 14 says the Father is greater than I, it's reflective of the fact that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay? As Christians, we believe he's both God and man and therefore has the attributes of deity, the attributes of humanity. 
There's, there's no problem there, and it certainly doesn't undermine Christ's absolute deity or the doctrine of the Trinity, as we uh, discussed earlier uh, and so forth. Very good. Dr. Ali, you have a one-minute rebuttal. Yeah, I think the question is well put, and it shows an internal contradiction in saying that Jesus is God and man at the same time. And this contradiction is uh, shown in many ways. For example, when he dies, uh, a Christian would have to say, this is the uh, word of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity dying on the cross. But here Christians hesitate and they say, no, well, no, God didn't die. It's the human aspect that died. And, and therefore, there is a separation between the human and the divine aspect right here. Uh, when Jesus says, uh, I do not know when the hour will come, they, they have to say, well, this is like the human part speaking here. When Jesus cursed the fig tree because he was hungry, he thought that the fig tree would have figs. He found no figs on it. He cursed the tree. So who felt hungry? The human. Who cursed the tree and caused it to wither? You'd have to say this is a divine element in him. And, and yet it would mean that the divine is acting at the behest of the lack of knowledge uh, of the human aspect. So there's an internal contradiction here that is not resolvable. Thank you. Reverend, Ra um, I'm sorry, Dr. Ali, question is for you, and it's this. In the first discussion, you consistently quoted Jesus as referring to God as his father. Why does a prophet refer to God as father if, according to the Quran, God is father to no one? If you say that the text you're quoting is corrupted, then why do you quote it as if it has Jesus' word? The nature of our debate was such that uh, on, on, the, on the debate regarding the Trinity, it wasn't a question of whether Jesus claimed to be God or whether he was actually God. Uh, the question was, does the Bible teach that Jesus is God? So uh, for that debate, I had to assume that this is what the Bible says. And, and starting with that, I have to ask, do these words mean that Jesus is God? And so even if we assume that he claimed this, does that mean that he is God? If Jesus claimed before Abraham existed, I existed, does that mean that he's God? No, because that does not fulfill the definition of God. It means that he's an ancient and great being, uh, but not necessarily God. And since there is only one God uh, on Jesus's own lips in the gospels, uh, then uh, clearly Jesus is not claiming to be God. In Mark, uh, Jesus is asked, what is the greatest of commandments? And he says, the greatest is this, that you should... Uh, uh, hero Israel, uh, the Lord your God is the Lord is one. And then the man says to him, you are right, teacher, there is only one God, and besides him there is no other. And Jesus then praised the man for his wisdom and understanding, thus confirming uh, the Muslim belief in monotheism that there is only one God, and obviously that is not Jesus, it is someone else. Uh, Jesus, uh, in referring to God as the only true God, uh, is uh, clearly uh, in the Bible itself teaching that uh, monotheism, and he is not teaching that he himself is God. Uh, Jesus uh, in, in the Bible falls on his face and prays to God. He, he In Matthew chapter 26, verse number 39, just as Muslims do today, if Jesus himself was God, uh, you would expect in the New Testament that he would be calling people to worship him and he would show them how to bow down to him. But rather he was telling them, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven. So he was teaching them not to pray to Jesus, but to pray to the Father. And that shows that when we take the New Testament as it is, we take the Bible as a whole, as it is, it teaches teaches monotheism, that there is only one God, not Jesus. Reverend Rogers, you have a one minute rebuttal. Yeah, so the question was, why does he refer to the teaching of the Bible if he doesn't believe it, that refers to God as his father? Now, I understand why he answered it that way. This is true. We were debating whether the Bible teaches the doctrine of the Trinity. And Shabir, of course, as a Muslim, does not accept, does not believe in the previous prophets or the apostles, even though the Quran says he's supposed to. However, it is clear that Jesus taught this. No, no, no liberal scholar would deny that Jesus taught that God is his father. Okay, this isn't just a Christian uh, belief because we believe in the Bible. When Shabir says that Jesus, you know, even if he said before Abraham was, I existed, that still wouldn't mean that he's God. Well, yeah, that statement wouldn't mean that, but that's not what Jesus said. What Jesus said was before Abraham became, I am. Only God could say that. Echo in me, it's a quote, it's a reference to God's statement in Deuteronomy 2.39, where God says, I am. That's where the phrase comes from. It's an exclusive divine uh, title. Uh, it should be referred to Mark 12. He said that Jesus quoted the Shema, that, there, that the Lord is one. Yeah. And immediately after that, he quoted Psalm 110, where Jesus said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my Thank right you. hand, referring to two persons as Lord. Our next question is going to go to Reverend Rogers. And the question is this. 
By saying that Allah has physical body parts, are you saying that this is a different Allah than the one Muslims believe in that doesn't have body parts? In other words, are you saying Muslims have two gods? I'm not sure I understand the question. What, what I'm getting at is that the, the sources, as I read them, and as the early Muslims read them, and as even many contemporary Muslims read them, I've got stacks of books here of, reflective of this, that Muslims believe this. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, a famous Muslim scholar, Ahmed bin Hanbal, one of the four founders of the four madhabs of, of Islam, or the four schools of jurisprudence in Islam that all Muslims look to, <clears throat> a champion of Islam. These sorts of things were believed by the early Muslims, have been believed down to the present day. Now, there are Muslims who reject that. There are Muslims who are embarrassed by things like saying Allah has loins, and I understand why they'd be embarrassed by that. I think the sources teach it. But even if you reject that, my point is that you're still left with an affirmation of existing entities in addition to Allah's essence. I know this is somewhat abstract and philosophical, but the fact is that this is a huge problem because they're not just saying that, that Allah has uh, an essential nature. Uh, they're saying that there are these qualities in addition to that nature that go beyond that nature, that can be added to each other and to that nature, and that's just not monotheism. It's asserting a plurality for their deity. And uh, so uh, I do believe that that is a violation of monotheism. It constitutes shirk by Quranic standards, and certainly by the standards that Muslims try to apply to Christians. Christ Muslims try to tell Christians that we're guilty of shirk because we believe in three persons. But remember, as Christians, we believe those three persons are one in their essence, Muslims don't believe that about Allah's attributes. They are not his essence. They're other than his essence. They're distinct from his essence and from each other. The Quran is something separate from Allah. It doesn't co-inhere in his essential nature. It's another thing. It's going to appear and intercede for them. So, yeah, that does constitute shirk. That constitute, that's a violation of monotheism. It's a fun, I mean, that's what we mean by saying something's not monotheism. If you assert a plurality of eternal things, that's not monotheism. Thank you. Our next question, it's for you, Dr. Ali. The question is this. Wait, doesn't... Oh, I'm sorry. He got a minute, I think. Time for rebuttal, Dr. Ali, and then we'll have your next question. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, what Anthony says reminds me of a verse of the Quran that says, What do lau takfuruna kama kafaru fatakununa sawa? Uh, they, they, they wish that you would disbelieve as they have also disbelieved so that you will all be equal. So, uh, Anthony, I think, has this problem to explain the Trinity and his comeback at Muslims is to say, look, you have a plurality within the uh, unity of God as well, and therefore you have polytheism uh, as much as you're accusing us of polytheism. By the way, I don't accuse uh, Christians of polytheism. I believe that Christians are trying to express a monotheistic faith, but uh, somehow uh, they got carried away with thinking of Jesus uh, as God. Uh, but uh, that's not the same problem that Muslims have. Muslims do not say that one of these attributes is a separate person from God who can die for our sins or something like this. They are attributes of God. We cannot say that they're not God. And at the same time, they're not exactly God. They're attributes of God. This is a middle position, and it's a totally reasonable one. Thank you, Dr. Ali. This question here is for you, Dr. Ali. Hebrews 1, 10 to 12 has God identifying Jesus as the Jehovah God who created the heavens by his own hands and personally created the earth, thereby describing him as the creator and sustainer of all creation. So why do you try to diminish his role as creator to a secondary status? So uh, we must understand, first of all, like the different perspectives uh, from which we can approach this book of Hebrews. First of all, we can ask, who is the author of this book? And if we don't know this individual, how do we know he was even a monotheist? And if you find a verse in which he is teaching you that Jesus is God, how do you know that he has the Trinity doctrine in mind that will make Jesus uh, and, and the Father one God? Uh, let us be clear about this. Christians will agree that had it not been for something like the Trinity doctrine, which shows that there is in the end, and only one God, to take Jesus as God would have been blasphemy, would have been heresy, would have been uh, polytheism. Uh, Christians agree, you cannot take a man and make him God. The only way you can take him uh, to be God is if he's God himself. And for him to be God himself, he has to be united with the Father who undoubtedly is God. 
And so Jesus and the Father together cannot be two gods. There must be only one God. Uh, but for that to happen, we have to know that if, for, for us to assume that the author of Hebrews is teaching us Trinitarian doctrine, we have to know more about the author of Hebrews. We just don't know enough. So even if you find that he is telling you that Jesus is God, uh, you, you cannot be sure that he is thinking of Jesus as being united with the Father in the way that Trinitarian doctrine requires. And, and in that case, how can you take him as an authority um, on, on the question? Moreover, when you read uh, the uh, book of Hebrews by itself, which was the subject of our debate, take it as it is. Does it really teach that Jesus is God? No, it has to be interpreted in the light of the rest of the New Testament from people like Paul, whose writings we do know are credited to him, where and Paul teaches clearly that Jesus is subordinate to the Father and will remain eternally so in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 28. Uh, so there's a, not only a distinction between God and the Father, but a subordinate role uh, for Jesus. Thank you. Okay, in response to the clear statement that Jesus is God in Hebrews 1.8 and that he's the unchanging Lord who created heaven and, and earth in Hebrews 1.10, uh, Shabir says, uh, you know, we can't be sure that this really means God for various reasons. We have to interpret it in light of other books of the New Testament. Notice the problem now that he has on his hands here. Number one, Shabir says, we don't know if this person was really a monotheist so that he's, these affirmations of Jesus as God might be something else, that the polytheism perhaps. Well, what, what do we know about the author? We know he's writing to Jews. He's writing to Hebrews, right? How do we know that? Because it's the book of Hebrews, right? He's quoting the Old Testament scriptures. Well, that should be a clear indication that this is a monotheist writing to monotheists. But remember, Shabir says we should interpret this in light of the rest of the New Testament, such as the writings of Paul. Was Paul a monotheist? 1 Timothy 2, 5, one God. You heard Shabir cite 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6, one God. Uh, repeatedly, Paul says there's one God. So if we're interpreting Hebrews in light of the New, uh, New Testament, there's one God, and Jesus is that God. Thank you very much. Last question directed to you, Reverend Rogers. The question is this. Regarding the documentary theory, in the first debate, Shabir said Moses probably didn't write the Torah, rather scholars say it was probably compiled from different sources, which would explain the differences in terms. Can you address this? Yeah, I'm glad for that question. I, I didn't get to address it in our first debate, although it wasn't necessary. Uh, Shabir, in, in response to my statement that Moses wrote the Torah, Shabir said, no, the, the Torah, according to scholars, is simply a patchwork of, of other sources that were later put together. He also said this accounts for why it appears as if one person is referring to another divine person, because these different sources use different divine names. So when they were combined, it looks like now we've got two persons who are divine. Uh, well, the problem with that is, first of all, the person who coined this or, or came up with this theory was Jean Ostra. He didn't deny Mosaic authorship. He thought Moses took the patriarchal records and by inspiration incorporated them into the account of Genesis. So that doesn't refute the idea that, that Genesis was written by Moses. Uh, but later scholars went off and tried to do other things with this. But uh, the fact of the matter is there's no evidence for different sources being put together. We don't have a single shred of documentation or documentary evidence for the documentary hypothesis. We don't have a single reference to these separately existing sources anywhere uh, throughout history uh, by anyone. So it's, it's pure imagination to uh, give this. And the, let's remember why this is being used, because Shabir is trying to account for the very clear uh, appearance of a plurality of persons in the Old Testament. And so it said, for example, the reason that we should hold this view is that one divine name is used here, another divine name is used here. Uh, but that assumes that the infinite God can't have multiple names. But what is the Quran? Doesn't the Quran say that Allah has multiple names? Should we assume that the Quran is a patchwork of, of contradictory sources? Uh, no. So I think that the reasoning is, is bogus. By the way, the documentary hypothesis has been modified and modified and modified so much that it has, to use the words of Anthony Flew, died the death of a thousand qualifications. The theory is in shambles today, and it's not a good one to appeal to in order to try and escape the clear Trinitarian teachings of Moses. Thank you. Dr. Ali, your response, please. Yeah, so um, I don't think that the, th the theory is dying. This is the Anchor Bible Genesis by E.A. Spicer. 
And uh, it clearly in this uh, writing, uh, this uh, starting with the very introduction, this is the theory that is adhered to. Uh, here is the interpreter's concise uh, commentary on, on the Pentateuch uh, by um, uh, John Marks, I see, and, and several other scholars. This is published by a Bingdon Press, uh, people who publish uh, Bibles. Uh, so, it, and, and it takes the same view. It even demarcates uh, step by step uh, which uh, parts belong to J, which part belong to E, and which part uh, belong to the priestly narrative uh, throughout the books of uh, Genesis uh, and, uh, and, and Exodus. Uh, so, uh, no, the theory is not dying. And uh, while we don't have uh, physical evidence for the theory, it is clear from the uh, literary analysis of the text that it was compiled from multiple sources. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Ali. That concludes our discussion panel. We are going to reconvene at six o'clock. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, panel members, once again.